Hey everyone, Nathan here, Absurd Being. All right, so object-oriented ontology. So this is the third video. Um, in this video, I'm just going to go keep going through the book and briefly summarize the main topics. And this will be the last kind of content-based video in the series. The next video will be the last one in the series proper. And um, in that, I'm going to revisit most of the, these topics that we've talked about in this and the last two videos. And just with a, with a bit more of a critical eye, have a look at them and see, see what stands up, in my opinion, and um, what is perhaps a little, a little weaker <clears throat> in the theory in, in Harman's object-oriented ontology. Uh, so, let's just get into it. The first topic is social theory. All right, so social theory, this is, this is not a massive dive into society and, and um, sociology or, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not a deep analysis here. I think Harman's main point in the book is to show how object-oriented ontology um, can can kind of feed into society or social theory how the, the the role that it can play and so the main idea is that object oriented ontology allows us to analyze a situation by looking at all of the objects involved and i've I've stressed all of the objects involved because you know when we when we we are we are all um, human subjects. We, we live a practical life. We're engaged in the world practically. We, we use objects. We have goals in mind. And that's, that's, that's kind of our everyday mode of existence, right? We come to a situation with this from a perspective um, <clears throat> that, that breaks the world up in, in a certain way, sees certain, certain objects that it that we normally deal with, that sees those objects from the perspective of, of myself as a conscious subject. So kind of centered on me. That's, that's, that's normal. What Object Oriented Ontology does is with that, um, that definition of an object as, as kind of the middle ground between undermining and overmining, what that does is if we, if we bring that to the situation with us, it lets us see objects that we might not otherwise have seen, that we might not otherwise have, have taken into account. And it, it does get us out of this, of the kind of um, implicit focus on ourselves that we always bring to a situation. Everything is always centered on us. And again, I'm not saying that that's bad. I'm just saying that that's the way we engage with the world on an every, at an everyday kind of uh, level. So, okay, so it lets us see these, these objects that we may, may not otherwise have seen. It lets us see how they're feeding into the situation, the role that they're having on other objects, on ourselves, on other people, and... And uh, it just broadens our horizons a little bit. Gives us just gives us another tool with which to look at a situation, and and that that I think can't be a bad thing, right? So I think it's the most useful aspect of trip of uh, oh triple O. I didn't want to say it. <laughs> I don't like that. It's that sounds a little bit um, when I first saw it in the book. He calls it triple O instead of object-oriented ontology. It, it's, it's definitely easier to say. I'm always tripping over the words, but um, it, it, it does have kind of a faddish almost feel to it, triple O, like a little bit of a, anyway, kind of gimmicky thing. <laughs> but um, oh, I did it anyway, triple O. So I think this is, this is kind of a useful aspect. He criticizes actor network theory. So that's Bruno Latour. And he raises three points. He thinks actor network theory overmines. 
He thinks it lacks the ability to distinguish between important and trivial events. All events kind of count equally. And there's no way to distinguish between important, momentous events, events that have real significance and just trivial events. I think his example is um, a hair falling from Napoleon's head or something like that. That, that that's an event and it's it's an equal, equally momentous or significant event according to actor network theory. And the third criticism is that it can't account for the life cycle of events. Um, I, I don't really, I'm not going to look at that in any more detail as criticisms of actor network theory. Um, if you know Latour, you'll, you'll know much more than, much better than I do, whether those are valid or how valid they are. I don't know anything about Latour, um, but it's just interesting to point out that, that he has that, like he's moving away from Latour there. I think he's, he's putting a, a bit of distance between him and, and actor network theory. The the main thing I think from this chapter that that struck me that I think was was important to take away were the four stages Harmon points out in object development. The first is growth. The second is maturity. The third is ripening, and the fourth is decadence. So we'll just break those down quickly. Growth. This is when symbioses take place that allow the object itself to take form. And by symbioses, he means bonds between other objects. So an object kind of comes into, into being, and or in the, in the process of an object coming into being, these it's, it establishes bonds with other objects. I think his example is a company here, which obviously is created by us. It doesn't, it doesn't do anything on its own. Yeah, we can still take it as an object. It still exists in its own right as an object. And in the course of it, the company becoming a company, it establishes relations with shareholders, with other companies that, it, that it's going to trade with or whatever. So all of these, these things, um, these bonds, feed into the process of, of growth, the first stage. The second stage is maturity, <clears throat> and at this point there's no room for further symbioses. So its indeterminacies have already been, have been eliminated by the establishment of irreversible bonds with other, with other objects. So the second stage, the, the object is kind of fully formed, crystallized, it, it has clear um, reasonably fixed bonds with other objects that it has an identity i guess you could say the third stage is ripening and in this the object feeds on its environment the object carries out whatever its function is whatever it, it um <clears throat> whatever its purpose is it just it just goes on and um fulfills that purpose the final stage, decadence, the bonds become counterproductive to the object's survival. So the bonds weaken, the object itself could fade, it may, it may just disappear, maybe it's no longer useful, maybe it no longer has any purpose or function. Um, or maybe it, maybe it morphs, maybe it changes shape, it, it, it establishes other bonds with other objects that, that mean that the original object can continue on, but perhaps in a different form. <clears throat> but anyway, the, there's the decadence. That decadence stage is where the original object fades. It disappears. Um, whether whether it is eliminated altogether or whether it just morphs, those are those are possibilities, I think. And that's it. That's all I'm going to have to say about social theory. But you can see the connection. How he's just highlighting what object-oriented ontology, triple O, what it, what it brings to, um, to, the, to, to social theory. All right, the next section, politics. In this section, again, uh, and this is kind of often Harman's starting point is Latour, 
So he, he kind of compares himself to Latour and then generally points out differences between him and, uh, and Latour. In this case, however, with his politics, he pretty much ends up agreeing with Latour. And there are really just two tenets to politics and, and the way that object-oriented ontology aligns or, or feeds into political theory. Two tenets which which are um, which kind of go against our, the way we normally think about politics, harm and things. The first tenet is that political knowledge is impossible. So you can see the connection here with object-oriented ontology because for Harman, um, actual knowledge of real things, real objects and the real qualities is also impossible. The object is a thing in itself, uh, something something we can never get access to, we never have direct access to. Um, and so I think that's kind of the connection here. Political knowledge is also impossible for slightly different reasons though. The way he describes it, um, which I, I think is, is kind of fair, and, and this is exactly from Latour as well. Um, politics is the situation where an issue arises and various stakeholders engage in a dispute that ends with a decision. And that's what politics is. And the important thing is that no knowledge arises from this process. At the end of it, we don't get anything we could we could call knowledge. We don't get any certain um, propositions about the world or about reality. All we get is, all we have is a decision that was um, made by these stakeholders. But there's no sense in which actual knowledge arises from this. So the term political knowledge, to the extent that we, we think we are gaining certain knowledge, that we're gaining truths or facts about the world through politics is um, is false and i've got a quote <clears throat> which i'm not gonna i'm not gonna throw it up on the screen i'll just read it it's quite short the quote is politics consists of coalitions lined up around the boundaries of an issue whose exact nature can never be determined and so again the connection to object oriented ontology it's it's um there, there is no certainty here with political issues. It's just there's always a kind of um, ambiguity, maybe a nebulosity that that surrounds these, and and nothing is is either true or false. Nothing is is crystallized in any way. There is no there's no sense we can talk about genuine knowledge here. Um, it's just people getting together to resolve. A problem, a dispute, and people with their own, um, with their own agendas, with their own viewpoints, with their own um, interests, and and it's just that's what politics is—the merging of all of this in order to come to some kind of resolution. But none of this has anything to do with knowledge. That's the first tenet. The second tenet is that human objects are not the only or the most important political actors. And the examples that he talks about, he uses, are the printing press, the atomic bomb, and the melting of the polar ice caps. These are all objects in Harman's um, philosophy, and his, according to his definition. And they all have more, I mean, these particular objects have had more significant effects than any individual human, right? Um, so yeah, so that that's that's Harman's take on that, um, and you can see, right? I mean, yeah, it's 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 a fair point. Human objects are not the only political actors. Actors might be a bit strong. That this is is the printing press an actual actor? Do we want to go that far? Um, I'm going to reserve, like I said, I'm not going to go too much into this. I want to discuss this in more detail in the next video. But um, that one's a little bit, that tenet I'm less comfortable with than I was with the first tenet. 
Um, but anyway, that's that's what Harmon has to say about politics. Let me leave it at that. And let's have a look at the third section, ontography. So ontography, I think this is um, Harmon's, maybe Harmon's most original or the thing that he really, um, his, his kind of stamp on philosophy is his ontographical rubric, I guess we could call it. So what it is. It's made up of four aspects, this, this ontography. Real objects, real qualities, and sensual objects and sensual qualities. So the real objects, real qualities, that's the unknowable thing in itself, the object in itself, the thing we have no direct access to. The sensual objects, the, the objects of perception, and the qualities as well, the qualities that we perceive. Um, okay. So that, that's what ontography is in a nutshell. Where it gets interesting is when he starts talking about the tensions that we can um, detect in this, in this ontographical model. So you've got real objects, real qualities, sensual objects, sensual qualities. The idea is that we can now pair these up, pair these different components in different ways and each pairing reveals something. So there are four main tensions that Harman identifies. The first is between real object, a real object and sensual qualities. And what arises from this, Harman believes, is space. <clears throat> so what does he mean by this? Okay. So to be in space, if we think about what space is, our, um, how we understand space, to be in space means to be, be related, for an object to be related to me through both proximity and distance. So the thing, the object, is it's over there in its own place. It's over there separate from me, at a distance from me, yet... It also, in order to be in that space, that separate space, it has to, in some sense, inhabit the same spatial arena as me. So there's kind of proximity and distance both wrapped up in, in what space is. And what Harman sees in, in the tension between real object and sensual qualities is that same dichotomy, that same um, uh, that same what? That same coexistence of proximity and distance. So the sensual qualities of a real object are also separated from it, right? Because um, the, the sensual qualities are just from through the, the act of perception, the real object is always beyond our grasp. So whatever sensual, ob sensual qualities we attribute to the real object, it's never certain. There's never any grounds on which to, to make the assertion that these, ob these qualities belong to the object. The real object is always beyond um, our apprehension. So the, the sensual qualities are separate from it, but they can't be floating around unattached to any any object, Harman says. We don't we don't have qualities that, that aren't attached. We never perceive qualities um, in and of themselves that aren't a part of an object. So the qualities must be bound to the real object in some way, but it's going to be in some kind of loose um, uncertain fashion and so we have that same that same dichotomy the sensual qualities are share the same um, that they have proximity to the real object but at the same time they are they must be separate from it because the real object is beyond any kind of sensual grasp any kind of understanding that we might form of it 
Um, and so from that, from that tension between a real object and sensual qualities, space arises. Okay, cool. So that's space. The other big one here is time. And time emerges through the tension between a sensual object and sensual qualities. So this is time as experience. And actually the, the space, I think, is also space of experience. It's spatial experience, not, not kind of an objective, geometric kind of understanding of space. Uh, and the same with time. It's time as experience, not an objective kind of scientific definition of time. So what is time? We'll, we'll approach time in the same way that we approach space. What is time? Time is whatever it is, it requires both endurance and change. It requires something to persist over, over um Requires something to persist. I don't want to say time. I don't want to bring that into my definition. Uh, it requires something that something remains permanent. But it also requires there to be change. It has to accommodate change. So we've got this, again, this kind of dichotomy, this coexistence of kind of um, opposing tendencies. Endurance and change. And we see this in our apprehension of sensual qualities and, sen and a sensual object. Sensual qualities change against the enduring background of a sensual object. And it's that which is what time is. And importantly, Harmon's claim here is not that he's just providing a phenomenological description of space and time, but that space and time result from these object quality tensions. So he wants to go beyond that kind of, uh, just a description. This is supposedly telling us how space and time actually come about. Okay. Fair enough. I'm, I'm not going to, like I said, I'm not going to debate those just yet. Uh, let's move on. To the two remaining tensions, the main tensions. The next one is between essential object and real qualities. And this um, Harmon calls the eidos or Plato's forms. He equates it with Plato's forms. And the idea here is that sensual objects have real qualities, uh, which, however, we have no access to sensual objects, there are real qualities that associated with them, um, but we just, obviously, because they're real, they are the thing in it, they relate to the thing in itself, we have no access to them. Um, and so this, Harmon calls eidos. Fine. And the last tension, real object and real qualities, so this is this is the the actual thing in itself, the object in itself. This is the essence for Harmon. Nice. So that's his ontography. Um, yeah, like I said, no no critical discussion of that just yet. We'll leave that for a little bit later. Um, we haven't quite finished with ontography, but I'm going to move into a next section to deal with this last part, uh, and the section is causation. Okay, so in causation, what we have, this is how Harmon explains causation, again with reference back to his um, ontography. Causation is what arises when we have two sensual objects. Um, the relation between two sensual objects. And the idea here is that, because, I mean, that, that's this is kind of the phenomenal realm, right? It's like the equivalent of Kant, Kant's phenomenal realm. We only ever see sensual objects interacting with other sensual objects. We never see real objects. So whatever 
when we see cause, cause, cause and effect, that must be between sensual objects, not between real objects, which, which we never perceive. So causation only takes place between two sensual objects, and the way that it happens is two sensual objects indirectly meet in the experience of a single real object. And that re real object is me. So, I am the site of causation. Causation only has meaning to the real object that is me. It only has meaning in reference to me. We can't talk about, we can't make sense of causation in the world of the real, as, as it might happen to, as whatever is going on with real objects. When we can't say anything about real objects, we have no access to those, right? And that, that's just pure Kantianism. That, that is exactly what Kant said about causation. Causality is one of the, categories of our, underst our understanding. It's, it's one of those a priori forms we bring to, we, um, through which we understand reality. We don't know anything about the noumenal or what's really out there. Um, all we know is the phenomenal and the way the phenomenal is constructed is uh, one of the, one of the, the features of the phenomenal is cause and effect. That, that's just one of the ways that we make sense of the world. And it's the same, exactly the same for Harman. Um, causation is, is purely something that happens in the observer, for the observer. Hence, two sensual objects. Where he goes beyond the causation of, of Kant, he talks about vicarious causation. So this is a little bit more suspicious, I think. And vicarious causation is a notion that arises between two, not sensual objects, but two real objects. So he's now asking what, what, what could happen when two real objects clash or, or interact and his answer is that two real objects only ever indirectly meet through the mediation of a sensual object and the sensual object is the image they present to each other of themselves so his example is, is two rocks one real rock strikes not the other real rock, but the sensual version of the other real rock. That's right, the sensual version of the other rock. I didn't need the real rock in there. In such a way that there are retroactive, retroactive effects on the real. So real objects can only um, causally affect each other through, this, through a sensual object which is the image they each present of themselves to the other. This is, and this one is very, so this seems very speculative to me. Um, like I said, I, I mean, I don't want to delve too much into the, uh, give a critique of this just yet, but, but obviously um, this seems going way beyond anything we can really know for sure. But, uh, yeah, okay, that, that's what he says. Two real objects indirectly meet through the mediation of a sensual object in such a way that there are retroactive effects on the, on the real. <clears throat> and we can't even really, I mean, that's a very broad description. There's no real um, spe specificities here. And you could... I mean, I guess Harman would say that's because we just we don't we can't say anything for sure about the real objects. We don't know how or in what way they're being affected, um, but there is some kind of effect on the real object. Um, it just takes place through a sensual object. Yeah, I mean that that's that's all I'm going to say on that because. Um, 
Harman doesn't go into massive amounts of detail on it either, but uh, but it's just there, and uh, we'll, we'll look at it in a little bit more detail in the next video. Okay, the last section for today, knowledge. So Harman's view of knowledge is that if you, it, it's helpful here to remember what we said about metaphor and aesthetics in the first, second video, in the last video. <clears throat> So knowledge, he says, can't be metaphorical. It's not like art. It's not like aesthetics. So it can't be metaphorical. It must be literal. And that means it must deal with qualities either in an undermining or an overmining fashion. So we're not dealing with metaphor. We're not, we're not dealing with these kinds of descriptions that... Um, aesthetic descriptions which... Which, which seek to apprehend um, a real object. So it can't be metaphorical, but nor can it be truth. And it can't be, knowledge can't be truth because, remember, direct access with reality is impossible. So it's not truth. So what, what are we talking about with knowledge? Knowledge, Harman says, deals, well, first of all, knowledge deals with qualities rather than the objects. And that's the distinction between aesthetics. We're dealing with qualities rather than objects. And knowledge is, for Harman, justified, untrue belief. So it's the inverse of what we said about aesthetics, which was an unjustified, true belief. Knowledge is a justified, untrue belief. So what does he mean by this? The process that we, we go through here is virtually identical, but like a, in a mirror image sense of what we saw with aesthetics. So we start with sensual qualities, which we perceive. However, these are, um, these are cancelled. These get cancelled because... In knowledge, we want something deeper than mere appearances. We don't want to know what the thing is like for me from this perspective. We want to know what the thing is like itself. How big is it? What, what color is it? What shape is it? What, um, what, what is its texture? We want to know all of these things, not as they relate to me. So not, not in terms of sensual qualities. We want to know what they're really like the real qualities. That's what knowledge is about, right? His example is the apparent size of the sun. When we look at the sun, we, we see something kind of small, but obviously the sun's much bigger than that. That's what we really want to know. We want to know the real quality, the real size of the sun, not as it is in relation to us. The problem, of course, is that real qualities are inaccessible. So what happens, the same thing that we saw happen with aesthetics, the real qualities, this time for knowledge it's real qualities, but the beholder has to step in, the, the observer has to step in. And the observer steps in by replacing the, um, the real qualities of the object with their own real qualities. And so what we get then the final combination in onto graphical terms is a relation between a sensual object, if we take the sun, the sensual object as of the sun, and the real qualities, not of the sun, which we don't know, but the real qualities of the beholder, of the perceiver, of the individual seeking knowledge. So sensual object, real qualities. And um, again, we can ask the same question how that we ask with aesthetics. How do the real qualities come from the beholder rather than the sensual object? Well, the, the real qualities of an object are experienced. They're always experienced in the background assumptions that make it visible to us. And these Harman calls the paradigm. And the paradigm is the basic conditions 
never literally stated, of which the scientific object is composed. And so that, that's how real qualities step in for the um, real qualities of the object. The real, that's how the real qualities of the beholder step in for the real qualities of the object through the background assumptions, through the paradigm that we bring to our um, perceptions of the object. So the real qualities then become the vague, initially unstated background assumptions on which the paradigm is based. And I think that that's definitely, I mean, I think that's right. I, I totally agree with that. Pretty much if we can, if we can dispense with all the talk of real qualities, um, of real qualities, then I think, you know, this, this is just becomes phenomenology then, doesn't it? If we get rid of that. An object is an object. It is what it is through the background assumptions we bring. I mean, that's, that's exactly what um, the phenomenologists have already said. Um, so fine. It's, Harman's just adding that the, the whole kind of, I guess he would call it the ontological structure, which... Um, or the ontological rubric of his real quality, sensual objects, that whole, that whole um, model. Okay, fine. I don't want to go into any details on that just here. That's, that's the picture. So the paradigm then, just bringing us back to justified untrue belief, the paradigm is untrue since it doesn't reflect reality itself, but it's justified because its unstated principles have been able to empower a great deal of fruitful work. That's exactly what he says. Uh, and that's why we have justified, because it lets us get a lot done, but untrue because it doesn't reflect reality itself. That's the paradigm. Those are the real qualities of the beholder. So instead of theatricality, which we saw regarding the um, regarding metaphor and, and art, where the the beholder of of the the metaphor or the work of art, whatever it is, has to get involved in it him or herself. They have to be they have to support the metaphor. They have to support the aesthetic experience. And if they don't, if they are, um, for whatever reason, they're just, they're not, they're not present for that experience. That maybe, it could just be something like, even if you're tired, you're just not up for an artistic aesthetic experience, then the aesthetic quality disappears. There is no aesthetics anymore. Uh, so th that was the idea with theatricality. Parallel to that. For knowledge, we have commitment. Harman calls this the, the uh, Harman calls paradigm and, and the uh, the idea behind knowledge or the the connection to the to the beholder. He calls it commitment because a paradigm doesn't require us to sustain it all the time. We don't have to to prop it up, support it through our through our own um, active engagement with with the article of knowledge, whatever it is, it's it's something which is always it's a background assumption. It's always there, whether 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 we feel tired, whether we're angry, whether we're um, interested in it, it's always there. So it doesn't require that same level of um, engagement, active involvement that we saw in metaphor. So knowledge requires commitment or knowledge is commitment, um, which is that the idea, yeah, the paradigm exists in some sense, whether, whether we like it or not, whether we agree with it or not, whether we, whether we're, whether we're interested in it or not. Okay. That's enough. 
I'm babbling. I always sometimes I get into those loops where I just start going on and start trying to think of synonyms, um, which I don't think I don't know. I don't know if that helps or not. But um, yeah, just start going around in circles. Uh, so that's everything. That's that's um, that brings us to the end of the book. Let's have a look at a summary, and then we'll wrap up. So we looked at social theory first. The idea here is that object-oriented ontology allows us to analyze situations by looking at all relevant objects. It brings all objects, it, it just lets us break up a situation into um, different objects that we, that we may not otherwise have noticed. The other big thing from social theory, there were four stages in object development. Those four stages, growth, maturity, ripening, and decadence. And again, just a, a nice way of thinking about how objects in, in um, real world, real life situations evolve and change and, and affect us, affect our society. The second section, politics. Two tenets here that were of that were really important. I thought political knowledge is impossible and human objects are not the only or the most important actors. Fine, the third section was ontography and these this was um, Harmon's rubric. Oh, that's how he, he kind of grounds his, his ontology in those four aspects, real object, real qualities, sensual object and sensual qualities. From these, he pairs these in different ways to derive certain things. The four main pairings that, that he looks at allow us to derive space, time, eidos, and essence. And the other key relations that Harman talked about were causation, two sensual objects com combining or the relation between two sensual objects and vicarious causation, the relation between two real objects. Finally, we looked at knowledge. Knowledge is the, um, in an ontographical frame of, in an ontographical way of thinking, knowledge is the combination of a sensual object and real qualities real qualities of the knower, of the beholder of um, the object or the qualities. And this, this whole relation ended up being made possible or, or grounded in paradigm. So based on paradigm, those fundamental conditions, unstated background assumptions, which um, which let an object come forth, which let an object stand out. And that meant that the that knowledge was defined as justified, untrue belief. Justified because knowledge, the paradigm, allows us to do a lot of work, allows us to get a lot done. It has some, some um, practical value and and ne but nevertheless untrue because it doesn't tell us anything about reality itself and that is everything so that's the whole book in a nutshell um the next video yeah we'll look at my um some of my my thoughts about some of these these topics where i think there's there's value where I think there's um, there's less value. So if you're interested in that, uh, that's what the next video is going to be. If you're just happy with the the summary of the book, then then uh, you can wrap up here. Either way, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you for the next video.